So there's my no conflict slide. Important to see that. Uh, so for the objectives, I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe just some history and especially regarding some of the legal things and the developments around e-cigarettes and, uh, and then talk a little bit about um, what's going on in, in our patient population. And uh, before I forget to mention it, there's a, um, I can share the information later. I don't have it in my slides, but there's a, a meeting in, a, in about a week that's a statewide meeting to talk about uh, vaping in Tennessee uh, about statistics from the um, health department. Um, and then at the end, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the health effects that we know about, what we understand, and also some of the things that we don't understand. And then uh, I think it's really important to talk about kind of some real practical matters is like, well, what tools do we have? How should we talk to patients? And um, what can we offer them in the clinical setting to try to help them out? So, uh, so just briefly, I was a little surprised when I started researching this to realize that uh, the idea of uh, vaping or electronic cigarette is um, older than I, re than I had appreciated. So the first patent was in, in the 1930s, and there were uh, multiple patents that came out in the 60s and 70s. Some of these devices didn't use a heating element, and not all of them uh, used nicotine, but they were all uh, some type of form of an electronic cigarette. Uh, substitute for combustible cigarettes. And then it was uh, 1979, Phil Ray had the first commercial product, which obviously didn't do all that successfully. He didn't, he didn't do great with it, but it used evaporated nicotine without a heating element. And uh, as early as 1998, the tobacco company in the United States was trying to work on this and they were initially denied uh, being able to market a product uh, because the FDA considered it to be a drug delivery device. And uh, this is kind of an important distinction, and this has been part of the legal um, discussion uh, since that time. So, in, and then kind of the modern era of what we know of as, as vaping and, uh, or e-cigarette use. As an aside, I would say probably uh, vaping is kind of a, uh, it's a friendly term that I think the tobacco companies appreciate because uh, what's coming out of the e-cigarettes really isn't vapor. Um, I mean, there's uh, other things in it that uh, it's not water vapor, and I think there's this impression that it's that's harmless, and they've uh, kind of used the language to their advantage with that. So um, Han Lick, uh, and my understanding was he was motivated to develop the vaping device because his father was dying of lung cancer, and he was also a cigarette smoker, and that's kind of the... Um, mythology behind this. Uh, it's interesting when I was researching, I, I found uh, you can find kind of uh, pro-vaping, pro-e-cigarette uh, websites that kind of cast this history in a completely different context. And that was a kind of an interesting experience for me to, to read about some of these same uh, like legal milestones and things like that. Uh, so in 2006, electronic cigarettes became popular first uh, more in Europe. Uh, they were still weren't being directly sold in the United States, but they were available imported. And then the FDA uh, banned those imports again because of it being considered an unapproved drug delivery device. And it's important to realize that up until 2009, the FDA didn't have uh, the authority to regulate these as a tobacco product, um, but they gained that authority. And uh, so like treating the e-cigarettes either as a Medicaid, me, medical device for delivery of medicine or as a tobacco product kind of changed uh, how some of these things were handled. Um, and in 2014, that kind of got clarified and the FDA was regulate, regulating e-cigarettes as tobacco products. And some of the requirements they had was that uh, there couldn't be sale to minors, uh, you know, re, uh, basic safety information had to be displayed of the ingredients and uh, studies to show safety. So for a period of time, no new vaping products were allowed on the market after that time. So kind of pausing in my timeline for a moment. So traditional combustible cigarettes, the nicotine taken in is, is free-based nicotine. It's very alkaline. And I've, I personally haven't smoked, but as I understand it, the um, inhaled nicotine that's alkaline is pretty uh, uncomfortable feeling on your throat. It's rough and that, that sensation is limiting to the dose that people can tolerate taking. Um, I think that's a big part of like different cigarette products have tried to like advertise for smoothness or 
ways that you can tolerate the nicotine. But that's kind of, I think, what stops people from uh, ingesting larger doses of nicotine. In 2015, uh, Juul Labs, uh, uh, e-cigarette company, kind of had the uh, breakthrough where they started um, lowering the pH of the nicotine product. And there's a couple of different ways this was done, but basically um, they added uh, benzoic acid or other things that would um, take away some of that strong alkaline uh, quality. And the consequence was that there wasn't that negative sensation when you inhaled that form of nicotine. It's a lot better tolerated. And they went a step further by even obscuring with flavorings as probably everyone's aware uh, uh, of that. Um, and it, it resulted in being able to ingest higher volumes of nicotine without some of those negative uh, side effects. And you just fast forward a few years later, all of a sudden Juul Labs held uh, three quarters of the e-cigarette market in, in the United States and uh, several billion dollar uh, enterprise. And the kind of famous thing that we know of Juul Pods, like Juul became kind of like uh, Google, like Juuling. Uh, was uh, a verb for smoking an e-cigarette or kind of like Googling is for doing an e-search. Um, but the company was sued by the, first by the state of North Carolina because of uh, marketing to minors, which was a violation of the, the uh, uh, FDA uh, restrictions there. And this was done on state level and many states joined in the lawsuit, uh, a total of 46 states. Um, and some of the other things that Juul was doing, as I mentioned, was they had many uh, flavors uh, and social media campaign that was clearly kind of geared towards uh, adolescent and even uh, like young users uh, trying to do some. U USDA banned this in 2022. Um, Juul still exists. They can sell some of their unflavored uh, products. And the current uh, legal category is that this is under review uh, by the USDA. Um, but the products that are still allowed are are um, thought to be unlikely to appeal to minors, and they can you can make an argument that they could be used for smoking cessation, and that's really been kind of the whole uh, kind of dilemma for the for the regulation here is that there's this argument that these are smoking cessation uh, helps, um, but then on the other hand you have this uh, what we know as this epidemic in adolescent age uh, patients where. Uh, they're being initiated to tobacco through through the e-cigarettes. So, all right. So, what does an e-cigarette look like? I won't spend too much time there. It's not super uh, complicated. You know, there's a power source. There's a usually a switch where you can either turn on uh, manually or or by breath activated. There's a little tank that holds the liquid, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And then there's some kind of a heating element. And uh, as I go forward and kind of talks about kind of the Fourth, the current fourth generation of uh, e-cigarettes, the heating elements have gotten more and more sophisticated uh, in, in how quickly they can heat up and a lot of fine-tune control that the user can have to, to uh, personalize their experience. And um, one of the end results of that is a higher amount of the nicotine from the juice uh, is getting delivered to, uh, to the lungs. So if you just look at the amount of nicotine in a cartridge, uh, that's not telling you the whole story because it depends a lot on the interaction with the heating element, how much is actually successfully aerosolized and delivered um, for consumption. You could think of it a little bit like when you're trying to nebulize albuterol, you know, not every patient's getting the same dose of albuterol out of the same vial, depending on a lot of other factors. So the, the juice that's in there, there's obviously there's the nicotine. Uh, there's glycerin and pro propylene glycol that are to help create the aerosol. And then as in the jewel pods, there's flavoring elements. This is significant because uh, some of the adverse health effects are actually traced back to the flavoring itself. Um, I think a lot of the natural comparison for any e-cigarette use when they're talking about safety profile is to compare it back to uh, combustible cigarettes and say, well, it's a whole lot better. We don't have tars and some of the other um, elements that are in an electronic cigarette, but there are things that are not in a cigarette that are not accounted for, and the flavoring is a big part of that. In addition to the glycerin and propylene, propylene glycol, we know those, those are well tolerated if you ingest them in the GI tract, but there's really not a lot of pre-existing, uh, there's not history of like in, inhaling those and what that does long-term to the lung. So here's some of the other uh, things that 
that are present in the e-cigarette vapor, and I'm using the word vapor with quotes around it in this context. Um, I'll draw your attention, diacetyl, um, if you're not familiar, popcorn lung is a form of uh, uh, a severe interstitial lung disease from people that did a lot of microwave popcorn to aerosolize the, the uh, flavoring of the popcorn and it can cause a irreversible lung damage that leads to bronchiolitis and bloater ends, P pretty severe problem. Um, and so, but that's one of the ingredients present. There's heavy metals, there's some known carcinogens, and then there's just elements that we're not really quite sure what they what they might do in their long term. So, and as I mentioned, some of the problems come from things that are in the flavorings themselves, or were in the flavorings when those were used more. This is a this is a graphic that was uh, available free online from kind of a pro vaping uh, website, but it does a nice job of showing kind of some of what some of the different devices look like. And I talked a little bit about fourth generation. The big difference here is uh, you've got a little digital readout and the person can kind of program and manipulate how that heating element works. It uses uh, alternating current instead of a simple battery. And it's just a lot more sophisticated. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't completely appreciate what that control uh, does for the user, but it, it allows them to modify things like how long of a breath they're gonna take um, how they hold it. And I think there is some part of it that's just a little bit like um, like a social media thing where you kind of like, it gets your attention to it. Uh, uh, a little bit like getting pings on your phone. All right. In our young patients, there are all kinds of like surreptitious ways that they can hide their e-cigarette use. This is just a few uh, kind of, they, they would be amusing if there wasn't serious uh, consequences here, but, but if there's vape hoodies where like one side you're in, inhaling the vapor and the other side kind of captures it so you're not sitting there smoking. You can, kids could use this in the classroom and the teacher wouldn't, they may not even be aware. There's car, car keys. I, I saw a whole set that looks like a pack of magic markers, all different hues, and they're, each one of them is a different disposable vape cartridge uh, watch. And there's many things I didn't put on here. One of the kind of sinister ones I saw, it looks like a like a meter dose inhaler, it looks exactly like they've got their albuterol in class and they may be sitting there puffing it and they're actually taking in a nicotine vapor. So some of the very best data comes from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which is done annually. Um, a lot of the studies that I went to were drawing data from that and analyzing it in different ways. So several of the slides as we go along, you'll see referring back to different years of this, of this uh, survey. But just the most recent published survey um, and, it, and I will uh, kind of underscore that the since the jewel banned, the prevalence of vaping is starting to decline the last couple of years. Um, but one in 10 middle, middle and high school students reported that they had used e-cigarette in the last 30 days on this study. And, and as it says on there, a good percentage of those were daily users. Um, I'm going to present some information that even though the prevalence is declining, we shouldn't be necessarily... Um, rejoicing because there's evidence that I think the more modern generation of the uh, e-cigarettes are actually uh, causing a higher level of addiction. And there's the way the users are interacting with the vape devices are um, concerning, especially in the young population. So if you go back a few years, this was kind of the, the peak. Uh, in the 2019 survey, more than a quarter of high school students reported current use, meaning in the last 30 days. And a little under 6% of them reported smoking combustible cigarettes, just to put that in context. I think back to my high school experience and this is much different, so. All right, this was, uh, there's a lot of good slides that came from this study. They looked back at data from that same National Youth Tobacco Survey over uh, an eight year period from 2014 to 2021. Um, and I, part of what I wanna draw from this is kind of a rebuttal to this argument that, oh, these um, e-cigarettes should be available as a smoking cessation aid. So certainly in kids, they should not be. And so um, this is just showing as a tobacco product, what was the first product that, that the users used? And in 2014, it was about a quarter of them that that was the first thing they came across. But by 2019, 78.3% uh, e-cigarette was their first interaction with uh, a nicotine product. Um, and, I, and even though the prevalence is going down, the age of first use is declining still. That hasn't, um, 
and uh, that hasn't uh, plateaued yet. So now there's a series of slides from this study I just mentioned, and uh, this is what I'm talking about. So this is from different tobacco devices and then the, the age at first use uh, along the year. And so e-cigarettes here, um, we're getting close to 75% as, as we're showing. Combustible cigarettes is the yellow line here. So that's gone down and down as the, the first uh, experience for smoking in a adolescence. This is uh, how many days out of a month the person used the e-cigarettes by year. So on the left is 2014, and then, then the brown one on the right is 2021. And so uh, if you just want to look all the way to the right side, this is 30 days out of a month. And you'll see that the percentage of adolescents that are using e-cigarettes every day out of the month has gone up every year, even in spite of uh, where that decline started um, after the ban. So I, I, I thought that was pretty concerning. Here it was, um, you know, we're close to a quarter of them. This one disturbed me the most. Uh, this is a person waking up, taking a puff of an e-cigarette within five minutes of waking. And what percentage of the adolescents in this survey reported using them that way? So these first several years, it was a few percentage, but um, even, after the, even after the ban, even after the prevalence is declining, the uh, percentage of users that are feeling that craving that they can't resist within five minutes of waking uh, has, has uh, been continuing to rise. And here's, yeah, it's more than 10% of, the, of those kids. So I, for me, this kind of um, helped me appreciate a little bit more. I, I saw a patient a couple of weeks ago that it was a 15 year old girl in my clinic and she had started uh, using e-cigarettes when she's 13. Her mom got them for her. Um, when she came to see me, her grandma actually had custody, and I don't know the details of the story of exactly why that changed, but I mean, the mom didn't show good judgment there. The mom was a, uh, was used tobacco products, and I think she thought it was a good idea for her daughter, and this girl was trying to quit vaping. She's 15, and she was struggling to quit, uh, not real successful. She was not using every day, but she hadn't been able to, to resist going back, and I think about these 10% of the kids that can't go five minutes when they first wake in the morning without uh, those urges overcoming them. So, uh, and then this is mean age at first use for vaping. And this is another thing I mentioned before, but you know, you go back to 2014 and it was close to 15 years old. My patient I saw was 13 and that's kind of the trend. It's middle school uh, that we need to probably be more focusing in on where kids are getting their first experience and exposure there. Um, so I, I mean, I, I applaud the, the FDA for making that ban to try to protect children, but it's obvious that that's not been 100% successful to buck that trend. So back to the idea of using e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, there's a nice Cochrane review uh, where they looked at a bunch of studies and there's a lot of biased studies that they had to throw out, but there were 10 that they thought had low chance for bias. Um, and you know, to be perfectly honest, if you just do a literature search and start reading, it's not too hard to find that the authors of the study were kind of, um, they wanted to find a certain outcome. But uh, here, just kind of the a nutshell of from the Cochrane Review, there were 10 studies they looked at, and they were looking at someone who had successfully quit for, um, let's see, did I put it on here? I think it had to be for 60, oh, yeah, for six months there. So they had had abstinence from combustible cigarettes for six months, but it did not mean that they didn't continue using e-cigarettes. So they may have just switched to e-cigarettes. Um, and they showed that there was, there was a sign that when, when you used a kind of a placebo e-cigarette that didn't have nicotine, uh, the nicotine e-cigarettes were more successful. So about seven additional quitters out of 100. And then they compared that to people that that um, just got behavioral support and like, uh, you know, either support group or no pharmaceutical. And they had two additional quitters compared to that type of cessation. So to me, that's kind of modest benefit for smoking cessation. But that's in, you know, this, these studies are mainly looking at adults. And this is not someone who's introduced to nicotine through an e-cigarette. And um, these, the, this is a Cochrane Review last updated in 2022. And I'm kind of concerned that it may not reflect some of the 
more addictive properties of the current generation of e-cigarettes. And I think that some of the, the I, I guess that's good to quit the combustible cigarettes. We know that's um, leading killer, um, but it's not a benign uh, trade-off there. Um, I came across an interesting website that was uh, advice that e-cigarette users were giving to each other of how to quit vaping. And one of them, the person was, they had their little vial with their nicotine juice that they were filling their cartridge. And every time they filled the cartridge, they would fill the vial back up with water. So it was slowly diluting the amount of nicotine there. And over several weeks, they got down to where they had, you know, they're using homeopathic amounts of nicotine. And this woman had successfully quit vaping because then it was just the psychological uh, habit of, of the vaping. There wasn't any more chemical and she was able to mitigate her, her withdrawal by doing that technique. I thought that was pretty clever. All right, so cigarettes for smoking cessation, I, I didn't bury the lead there. I think this is a really disingenuous, disingenuous argument that the industry uses. Um, and it's the same people that are selling them the cigarettes are the ones that are trying to market these products for smoking cessation. So I mean, that that just sounds like a bad plot to a movie. Um, and they very sophisticated marketing tactics uh, targeting teens um, and, that, and uh, the nicotine vapor um, effect on the brain. I haven't talked a lot about nicotine, but I have a little bit more about that shortly here. Um, there's reason for us to be more concerned that that uh, that can enhance the um, the addic addictive property. So this this was a um, study where they they did timed pets. PET scans on uh, 17 patients, uh, male and female, different demographics, but they took one puff of a modest dose of uh, e-cigarette. And when I read the um, methods, the amount in that is much lower than most people are using, like that you're just seeing vaping around town. Uh, but they took one puff and then they, and it was radio labeled uh, nicotine. And then they watched to see where it went in the body. Um, and the, sh the main takeaways from that is that it reached 50% of the maximum uptake in the brain within 27 seconds, but initial arrival was within the first 10 seconds. And these uh, slides over on the top are showing, they, they divided between male and female. Uh, they're showing that it's, it's similar to how, how quickly combustible cigarette, uh, and also the females um, get a higher peak from the same levels of nicotine inhaled. All right, let me move on a little bit to some of the negative health effects. Uh, we could spend a lot more time talking about that. Uh, I just want to hit a few high points, and I try to think more of the things that had to do with our pediatric patient population. So as I mentioned, the nice thing about the e-cigarette is we don't have some of the combustible products that are from a from a combustible cigarette with tar or carbon monoxide. There's the known carcinogens in cigarettes. Um, but, but some of the negative effects from vaping that we do know is that there is still increased risk of heart disease for people that use e-cigarette. Um, and I'll show, share a couple studies here. There's been reports of nicotine toxicity where a child or a pet got into the supply of nicotine and had an acute ingestion. Uh, and even through the skin, that's been reported. Um, nicotine effects on development of the brain in children, I think, a really good talk would probably spend the whole talk just talking about that, and it would be given by someone that's an, an expert in psychology and brain chemistry, and I'm a pulmonologist, but I do uh, have a, a little bit of slides talking about that. Um, and then I, and there is carcinogenicity uh, in some, we know some of the inhaled uh, products in the vapor are carcinogens. We don't have good long-term data to say how big the risk are. I think probably they're lower than a combustible cigarette, but it's not none. Um, and it's probably enough that we should still be concerned. So um, this is going back to kind of my rebuttal of the use of uh, e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation. So here uh, they looked at more than 17,000 kids and it was just like, uh, uh, how likely were they to smoke cigarettes after initiating with e-cigarettes? And so basically the chances were a little over 7% for this. I didn't do a good job of, uh, of uh, showing the population of this study, but um, it, it was done in both high school and college age people. But the, the chances that they would ever smoke if they had not ever used e-cigarettes was a little over 7%. Uh, 
And it was almost three times that for someone that had ever, even just one time, tried an e-cigarette. Um, so I, I think it's kind of the opposite of this argument that it could be smoking cessation. Rather, it's an on-ramp for other tobacco products and, um, and also um, marijuana products. And this was from 2017. I, I didn't find something that was a little more recent, but I think there's probably um, going to be even stronger data there uh, with the, that reflects the newer generation of e-cigarettes. All right, risk of myocardial infarction. Uh, I think the next slide will put this in context a little bit more. These aren't amazing studies. This is a survey of patients report, self-reporting uh, if, if the doctor ever told them they had a heart attack. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that had heart attacks that are not going to be around to answer that survey. Um, but they, they're self-reporting their e-cigarette use and whether they had a heart attack. And uh, here, uh, I, I mean, note the error bars. It's not, uh, you know, it's not incredible data. But um, so here's former smokers. Uh, and then daily users of e-cigarettes in the dark bar and then cigarette smokers compared to the baseline risk of heart attack in the dotted line. So you can see that the risk is less than a cigarette smoker, but it is significantly higher than the non-user. Um, and then even the non-daily e-cigarette users had a little bit higher risk of heart attack. All right, what about secondhand uh, exposure to e-cigarette vape? Uh, vapor. Um, this was similarly a uh, self-reported uh, questionnaire. This was uh, done in Kuwait, and they um, surveyed high school age students that had uh, e-cigarette users in their home. And I won't go into the, a lot about the detail, but they used a standardized scoring uh, index to ask about uncontrolled asthma symptoms, and that includes uh, wheezing, chronic cough, uh, and nighttime symptoms. So, um, these households, about a little over a fourth, uh, had current within the past seven day electronic cigarette user and, and not a little bit lower, but combustible cigarette users. And there was some overlap where both were present in a few of those households. So if they had more than three days a week of exposure, uh, the uncontrolled asthma symptoms were, were more than twice as high on, the, on that Isaac index that they used. Um, so I, again, these are, uh, these are self-reported uh, surveys, um, but uh, but it's uh, starting to be in a, a preponderance of evidence that, that it's not as benign as uh, maybe the marketers uh, kind of would like like to uh, be able to say. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, talking about this, but um, the use of e-cigarettes and a higher chance of progressing on to, to different marijuana products uh, is, a, is a known association. So this is an older uh, study from the same National Youth Tobacco Survey, uh, where they just looked at if they'd ever used cannabis uh, in e-cigarette users. And um, so in all students, they answered close to 9% had ever used cannabis. But when you just limit it to ones that had ever used an e-cigarette, it was more than 30%. So I think there's um, some pooled risk takers there that are willing to try anything. Uh, but there's definitely an association. So I, if nothing else, I think when you're seeing a child that you know has used um, e-cigarettes, you, you can you can be aware that other behaviors are probably uh, more likely as well. All right, I um I know my talk will be made available um, in the Journal of Physiology. Uh, you want it all? Uh, there's this nice, pretty sophisticated discussion about the chemical. Uh, effects of nicotine in the brain and the regulation of, of the different nicotinic receptors. Um, they have a mouse model where they modeled adolescent brain and exposed to nicotine, and it showed uh, differences in the uh, mice behaviors between adult and adolescent mice that were exposed to the same levels of nicotine. And the and part of the discussion that I didn't completely follow was how how that affected other um, future exposures, but they hypothesized that there was increased likelihood of acquiring other addictions. Um, but the bottom line of what I took from this was, was the brain chemistry was different in the adolescent brain in their model, and, and it showed a lot different interaction with the nicotine. And I think we see that in uh, the way our, our patients behave compared to how adults behave, the way they behave when they try to uh, 
when they experience withdrawal is different than adult withdrawal. And I think they're grappling with some different things when they're trying to, to uh, stop using. So um, eVolley, uh, hopefully that's something you've heard of before. This is an acronym given to uh, a poorly described acute severe lung injury that's uh, vaping related. So there's a series of cases. One of the most well-known was first a group of uh, kind of young adults in Utah that presented and um, these are people that are in an in intensive care unit. There are some that are fatalities. Um, and there's a CDC kind of case diagnosis for this where um, they have to have used e-cigarette within 90 days of onset. They have bilateral infiltrates. You've kind of ruled out other infection and there's um, elevated acute phase reactants and acute respiratory uh, failure. Um, so a couple uh, CT scan images of this eVolley phenomenon. You can just see this kind of diffuse ground glass on both sides that progresses to some consolidation. Um, so uh, I didn't necessarily want to draw anything real particular from this other than that they're just really ugly CT scans that are kind of scary looking. Um, and these patients were pretty sick. So what was it that caused this? Um, um, the best data that I could find was a was a review of all the uh, published case reports they could find. And I think the kind of accepted hypothesis now is that this is a reaction. Uh, most all the reported cases are people that had used uh, their vaping equipment and either made a homebrew or they were using some kind of uh, juice that had um, THC added. And so and then the vitamin E acetate was the common one of the common carrying uh, things in their in the nicotine product. So when those two things were combined together, the vitamin E acetate and the and the THC, it was people that were doing that, um, basically trying to use their vape to to uh, deliver marijuana. Um, th th that's the patient population that's having this uh, acute evoli phenomenon. So the study listed off other uh, things that were found in the vapor. Um, and there's a few hypotheses, but this is the strongest association. So it's not been reported as much with the, just the, the standard use of the commercial products, fortunately. I know um, I've been here a little over a year now, and I know there was a series of kids that were in the emergency room from uh, 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 the local area uh, last year. And I tried to see if I could find more information. I wasn't involved in taking care of any of those patients. Um, and I don't know quite what it was that ended up in the ER, but I kind of wondered if they had been using using their vape equipment for marijuana. All right, and then the final thing I wanted to spend a little time was talking about, well, what can I actually offer this patient? And when my uh, patient that I saw, the 15-year-old th girl that's trying to quit vaping, uh, we got done and I was finishing up my note for the day and I felt like I hadn't done as good a job as I should have done with supporting her and giving her encouragement and um, I was aware of some things to, to do to help her, uh, but I, I looked back and I felt like I should have put more of the time of the appointment to addressing that specifically. She was actually coming to see me about something unrelated and we had other things we talked about, but what could I have offered for her? I guess, first of all, even before I talk about that, like how, how, is it, how can we successfully talk to patients about this? Um, I think a lot of the authority figures in kids' life have a tendency to, to try to like guilt them or um, control them. I've never found that to be a successful way to interact with an adolescent. Um, and so I really very much want us to be aligned where I am on their team. And when we're in the visit, you know, the parents in there, there might be times where the parent uh, can step out if that's appropriate. Uh, but even when the parent's in there, I don't want anyone to feel like they're under attack. We're all on the same team in that conversation. And I'm looking for honesty and I'll tell them, I say, I'm not the police about this. Um, it's the same way when I'm trying to find out if they're being adherent with their medications. I'm not the police about this. I just need information. And so I usually will ask them uh, when I'm just taking a history of any, if they have any friends that vape. Um, so I, it's not a direct thing. I'm not accusing them of anything. And uh, a lot of kids will tell me they do. And then that kind of leads to like, well, you know, how much are you around it? Is that, have you ever tried it? And it gets easier and easier for them to kind of tell me the whole story there. Um, and so I like that as a leading question that's not, they don't usually get on guard as much about that and I can uh, gain a little trust there. So uh, 
a couple of programs. So the NIH sponsors one called smokefree.gov. And I put the URLs for some of these in here. I couldn't figure out a really good way to pull in the screen things with the, with the online version of um, PowerPoint that we have now. But one of the cool things with this smokefree.gov, so it's a bigger thing. It's for like smoking cessation, but there's different compartments in the website. And one is about teens and about vaping. And you can like, there's the little on the bottom right of the screen, you can have a live chat with the representative and talk about other resources they have. And they have like different sections you can go into where you can build a quit plan for vaping, what to do about stress. And the nice thing about this teen section of the smokefree.gov is that these are all testimonials from other teenagers. Um, if I was a teenager vaping, I'd go there and I'd feel like I'm hearing from peers of mine under these different sections that are kind of giving some advice of like, what did they do to deal with stress? And, and uh, I've, I've been surprised at how much kids talk to each other about this. And uh, I think almost all of our adolescent patients probably know someone that's trying to quit vaping. Um, all right, there's another uh, uh, not-for-profit truth initiative. And you've, these are the ones that are that do some of the commercials you may have seen on TV that are kind of the real attention getting commercials. Um, one of the reasons I really liked this one is that um, they have a text-based support thing. So, it, so one of your adolescents can um, subscribe to this texting where they'll get daily supportive messages from their peers, things that are very much geared for their age group. Um, and, uh, and I think it's kind of talking to teens in the language that they talk to each other. Uh, and it, it very much feels like they're getting it from their peers. It's not like an authority figure is telling them what to do. And there are also some support resources for parents there where they can also initiate it a couple different ways, but they can get on through, through uh, texting. So their quit rate overall, and this includes for uh, smoking cessation of combustible cigarettes too, is, is almost a third of the users are able to quit uh, within their first, uh, their first go at it. If you look at smoking cessation more broadly, just in a big population, um, usually people uh, need multiple serious attempts to quit. Um, one of the uh, strongest uh, associations, like if you had to, if just if, if I talk to parents that are trying to quit smoking and we're, we're trying to predict who's going to be successful, the single strongest predictor of, of success in, in smoking cessation is the number of times they've tried to quit. And the higher the number of times that they've tried to quit, the higher their chance of success that next time goes. But if you talk to the person that's trying to quit, a lot of times they believe the opposite in their in their mind they're discouraged or they think it's too hard for them um, and so that's that's uh, that can be extrapolated to kids that are trying to quit vaping too so I think they need encouragement sometimes they don't even need to do some different magically different approach they just need to keep on uh, set a date get it serious about starting you know get rid of their materials away from them so that it's uh, they can resist the temptation easier and just be real supportive and positive and they don't need to get so discouraged about the the backslides or the failures where they got back into it, just get serious again the next time. So this was something I'm not, I was kind of not sure if I should share this one or not, but this was a series of um, YouTube videos on a channel that wasn't familiar to me called Awesomeness TV. It's like this Gen Z content. There's like a little, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff on there. There's like a soap opera and some other things like that, but they had this whole section that was a, called My Vaping Mistake, where it's, Young, young adults or teenagers that are talking about their experience vaping and it's a little in its videos and it's about their experience and how hard it was to quit or different things um, and what they did to finally succeed. And so I, the thing that appeals to me about, about this one that I think might appeal to patients is that um, it's again, it's kind of interacting with their normal um, places they're attracted to spend their time and feeling supported by their peers and creating positive peer pressure of like, yeah, I'm not the only one that's gotten mixed up with this and other people have had to deal with it too. And uh, it's not like, you know, the doctor sign them up for this program or their parents in charge of them quitting. There are uh, school-based programs. So there's one that's uh, sponsored by MD Anderson called Aspire. Um, and I think you can easily find these just with a, with a, a Google search. Um, there's Vape Free Schools Initiative through the American Heart Association. Most of this is free. They do have a thing where you can pay tuition and become certified to administer the program. Um, and 
uh, on their website, they have things where like if someone gets caught vaping at school, it's an alternative to suspension where they can enroll in this little online uh, education program they go through. And then it has uh, cessation support for each individual student that can be done. Um, when I was, uh, I was visiting the public library in uh, Irwin in Unicoi County and they were having a little public event and there's a bunch of little booths there and this caught my attention. There was a, a big billboard from uh, the Unicoi school district where they were talking about the Catch My Breath program that they did. And this is a commercial product um, that was actually developed in my old stomping grounds in Central Texas that is similar to uh, this Aspire program where, where there's school education, people enroll and they get certified to, to administer the program. And it's got education things for the students. It's got um, alternatives to uh, school discipline that they can do if they get caught vaping. The laws in Texas require them to get mandatory, like if a child gets caught vaping in school, there's mandatory reassignment to a different school. Uh, and, I, and I think in practice, it's usually temporary, but it reinforces the interventions. And so the kids can't really kind of, the families have to take it real seriously. I know in Tennessee, I don't think we handle it quite that way. Um, there's a lot of things we do different in Tennessee than Texas. I'm really appreciative of, but anyway, that program, uh, is a commercial program. I'm not necessarily endorsing it. I just, it caught my attention because it was in use locally and Unicoi County school district was using it. And so I don't know more about that, of, of how they chose that. Um, but the person at the booth, uh, said that there's a lot of good parent feedback about it. So, uh, so back to my objectives, um, we talked about kind of the history there about the anatomy. Um, we talked about the jewel pods being banned um, and how that uh, that's had a big uh, impact in decreasing the prevalence, at least turning the, the tide of, of that real rapid increase in use to at least now we're starting to see reduction in, in uh, new users. Um, however, there's evidence that, that some of the addictive properties may be stronger than they had been. And then health impact, in particular, we talked about the e volley which is associated with the combination of the vitamin E acetate and the THC combined in the homebrew vape uh, products. And then hopefully there's uh, some different tools that you can have at your ready to share with individual patients. Um, I think if you get a patient to be honest with you about their desire to quit doing this and that they've done it, that's a great victory. And you should really celebrate the honesty with them then and there, and they should feel really positive about that visit and supported. And uh, hopefully each time we interact with them, we can keep on you know, giving them more encouragement and probably they're gonna struggle for a while. It's not, these are not uh, benign things they've been doing and, they're, and they are uh, strongly addictive. So I've got uh, time to make available for questions. 